you uh, everyone for being here. We're also live streaming on Facebook today. And Tom is here. He made it. Yay. I don't see him. Um, welcome, Tom. Uh, he should be appearing momentarily. Okay. Um, but thank you everyone for being here. Um, my name is Francesca. I am the program associate with the URI Cooperative Extensions Master Gardener program. Uh, URI Master Gardener, uh, our program is a mission is to educate citizens about environmentally sound horticultural practices through the dissemination of research based information. Um, and Radio Hour is one of the many public programs uh, we have for doing that. And we will actually be taking a break from Radio Hour uh, for November and potentially December as well this year, um, with hopes of being back next year. Um, but you can catch up on past installments of Radio Hour because we have been recording each of these. And I should start recording this one as well. Um, let me just do that. Uh, we've been recording each of these and posting them on our website. Uh, so if you go to our website and scroll down, you'll find them sorted by month. Um, and so we have the video and the audio version. So if you want to just take it out into the garden with you, um, you know, it's on SoundCloud. So you can either stream it or you can download it as an MP3, take it out in the garden and have Laura, Roger, and Tom all, all in your ears, uh, talking about all things gardening right. out there. So we definitely invite you to check that out. <laughs> um, also wanted to let you know, seeing as um, if you're attending this, you're probably a gardener yourself or someone interested in getting into gardening. We are currently accepting applications for the 2022 Master Gardener core training program. And the core training program equips learners with a solid framework of research-based gardening knowledge. And then the volunteer internship you complete afterwards of, 15, of 50 hours is an opportunity to sharpen your gardening skills. Um, and then after 50, 50 hours, you become a certified master gardener. And our delightful panelist and today moderator, Laura, uh, completed her 50th hour of her internship uh, right. last radio Thank hour. You. So Laura is officially a master gardener and stepping into the role of moderator today accordingly. Um, so if you are interested in learning more and potentially applying to the core training, I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, those applications are due on November 1st, so just a couple of weeks. Um, all right, moving on to today. So we have a few pre-submitted questions. We always have space for live questions, um, as many as we can fit in. And uh, we have some topics as well that our panelists are going to discuss all about fall in the garden and, uh, you know, what we're doing now, what we're doing prepping for the winter, thinking ahead of next to next year, all of that. So I will hand it off to Laura Lapata, who is going to be our moderator tonight. And Laura is a graduate of the 2021 core training class, um, but she's been gardening for years more than that. Um, and her interests include unusual fruits, edible foods, forests, seed starting, and canning and preserving food from her garden. And speaking of canning and, poo and food preserving, we also, um, URI Cooperative Extension has a food recovery program um, and a food recovery certification course that we are starting. So you can find more about that on our website as well. Uh, but I will hand it off to Laura. Well, thank you, Francesca, very, very much for that lovely introduction. Um, and let me also say, just jumping off of that, um, I did do some Hope's Harvest Gleaning this summer, and it was fabulous. If anyone is interested, uh, they are still, you have to go through, hi, Tom, they're still going, you still have to go through a, a little bit of a training, uh, but it, it was really marvelous and you're doing something good and you're outside and it's wonderful. So if you have any uh, interest, please uh, look at uh, Hope's Harvest to do that. Um, so, Francesca has asked me to uh, say that we have been bringing you this virtual radio hour uh, since June. Uh, we are going to be taking a little break, but when we come back, we'd like to come back with a new name. And to that, we'd like to ask you to take a brief survey. I think Francesca is going to put in the chat as to what you think um, our new name should be. Thank you ever so much for that. Uh, we look forward to seeing what you have to say. Uh, the virtual radio hour is one of the many public education services that is offered by the URI Master Gardeners. The URI Master Gardening and Environmental Hotline is available five days a week to answer any of your garden, gardening questions by email uh, and until the end of October by phone. Also, the URI Master Gardener program is now on Instagram and please follow us to keep up to date on events, programs and all of the research based gardening information you could hope for. Plus. Uh, learn all about uh, being a master gardener volunteer and how to become one yourself. So, um, to begin, 
uh, we're, we just want to ask uh, Tom and Roger, what's going on with your gardens? Uh, what's what's going on? Roger was telling us, Tom, that he's mostly put his garden to bed and he is he is uh, been planting some garlic. What's been going on with your garden? Still getting some things out. Green beans are still producing. Well, I'm down, I'm very near the water. So in Narragansett, it's still pretty warm. We haven't had a night below 50 yet. Nice. So took a couple cucumbers a couple days ago, but the, everything's looking pretty, pretty end of the season, but there's still some stuff coming. So, you know, I, I'm going to drag it out as long as I'm still getting something to eat. Exactly. Uh, I picked my first zucchini actually uh, a couple days ago because I started oh, wow. very late and I had a groundhog that came in and got a lot of it early, but I'm very happy. I got one, <laughs> I got one zucchini. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Does it look like you're going to get some more? Uh, maybe one. Uh, and then I have some boxes that I had uh, tomatoes in there, um, four by four wooden boxes, and they're out in the sun. And I pulled the tomatoes in three of them, and I have radishes, lettuce, and turnips growing in them. And I intend to cover them in uh, November to hopefully get some late uh, crops in those boxes because they're nice and warm. And as long as it doesn't get really, really cold at night, my plastic covers should keep it warm enough to keep producing. That's nice. Tom, just, where did you, where did you plant your uh, squash? In the garden. The garden, uh, I've got a very persistent groundhog that seems to be climbing up the outside uh, fence and keeps coming in. Just about the time everything starts to recover, he comes back in. He's very clever. Right. Yeah, because I, I started uh, my squash, well, actually, the winter squash a little bit later than usual. Um, and Unfortunately, the, the leaves, I, I got a, um, some powdery mildew uh, and the leaves certainly weren't healthy. It might have had a fungal infection and such, but the butternut fruit itself only got to several inches, no more than four or six inches. They were really, really small. And I could tell that they weren't going to get any bigger because the vines are dying, the leaves are dying. Um, and I just wanted to get an idea because I did plant those late and you and I don't live that far from each other. Um, and, and yeah, certainly it's warm at night. Well, I, I covered the zucchini and the other squash with uh, a cover because I had this issue then, but then as the, uh, uh, female fruit were the female blossoms were coming out. I uncovered it and since I uncovered right. it, the groundhog found his way back in and ate most of the leaves, but, um. So you can't cover them until when they're, when they're trying to get them uh, fertilized. You've got to have. Well, that's where a Q-tip and a paintbrush comes in handy, Tom. Uh, I've never done that. Have you done that a lot? I, I have, I have, uh, and it does seem to it does seem to work. Um, uh, yes, I have used it because I've got some fruit trees um, in the house, and so I got used to hand pollinating uh, Meyer lemon trees and such. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, I do. If I think there's, if it's better to be covered. Then I do go in and I cover it back up. I will have to try that. It, it's not difficult then. It, it's easy to do. So easy. <laughs> T tell us about how you do it. Well, you, you go in and you go in either with a very small paintbrush, like one of those, you know, children's paintbrush kits you would yeah. get for a dollar for 10 brushes. Uh, you go in or with a Q-tip and you just go in and uh, you, you just go all around and you, you touch the pollen from, from, from and, it, and it works. From the male flowers. It? Yes. Yes, we got to make sure everybody understands. There's male oh. flowers that rise. The flowers that rise above the main stalk on a skinny little stem, that's a male flower. The female flowers come off the bottom of the vine, and it's uh, you see the little baby zucchini there, the ovary of the, um, of the proto-zucchini. So what you're talking about doing that uh, brushing of the male flowers and then brushing the Yes, flowers. and and the female flowers also look as though they have three little stamens, even though it's all uh -huh. one, they're three little parts, and the male only has one. So if if you, you know, need some more help telling them apart. Well, that is a very good clinic. Maybe we'll get everybody <laughs> to do this next year. It is, it is. And I, I was going to ask Tom, do you only use um, one layer to cover or do you use two? Now, one at this point. Okay. And, and have you ever just, gotten to two? It's Rime. It's clear. You know, yes, it's, yes. Um, yeah, it's Rime. Light, medium, heavy? Uh, I think it was medium. Nice. Very, very nice. I swear by Rime as well. 
Yes, uh, I do too. Early, early in the season, uh, during the season to keep uh, keep right. things away. And end of the season, unfortunately, I, I, I didn't uh, plan uh, as much as I wanted to to extend the season this year. But that's definitely my go-to material. There's several different um, uh, names that goes by. Um, I'm looking at one. I, I to remind myself, I took it this uh, out of the garage this afternoon. It's called Harvest Guard. Um, but if you look up Reme R E E M A Y, uh, there's a lot of different products out there. And um, yeah, I, I definitely endorse any any Reme ground cover. You know, to start your garden early and to extend it this time of year as well. Even though I didn't do it this year, plan <laughs> on going course, back to those habits. Of course, the other thing that's needed here uh, for a squash, particularly or even uh, brassicas late, is that you need hoops as well. Yes. So yeah, that's the two part process. The reme is the cover, but to keep it up off the plant, you need you need hoops. Exactly. They, you can get them in various garden stores. A absolutely. Absolutely. And then something to attach them as well, whether it be uh, what On they the sit with it yes. or the or the clothes fit. No, but actually the rume to the hoops as well as ah. to the stuff in the ground, depending. But but last season I brought some I brought some uh, plants into my unheated sunroom. And wasn't sure how cold it was going to get because it was unheated and it's only one pane. And I used Rime over over the potted plants and it worked just fine. Nice. I didn't. It wasn't too pretty, uh, but it kept them it kept them alive all winter. I don't think it really got cold last well, uh, year until almost Christmas, right? Exactly. Exactly. But <laughs> even in February and March, um, I kept it. I kept them covered, and uh, it was lovely. <laughs> so nice experiment. Um, yeah. So, uh, fall planting, uh, Tom, I know that you've been doing some fall planting or thinking about doing some fall planting. Yes, so, yes, like I said, I have radishes, uh, lettuce and turnips in in seed process and I have some carrots still going that I seeded in about 5 weeks ago. So, oh, nice. I have some stuff that hopefully uh, I have some fall crops coming. Good. And 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 Roger, I know that you put your garden to bed mostly, but anything. Oh, uh, yeah, charge? mostly. But I, I did I did save several um, uh, Swiss chard because they're going to keep going going. They like it with snow on their leaves, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to remake them, uh, keep them going, keep picking them. Um, like Tom, the carrots uh, the carrots starting to come. Uh, I have some leftover beets uh, that I'll just leave them be and see what goes. Um, I just uh, uh, finished the uh, lettuce up. And I should have planted more. I always somebody told me once. I guess it was in a master garden class. Plant your lettuce seed every two weeks, and then you'll have uh, lettuce from the beginning right through the, to the end. And I tried to do it. I was pretty good. I got pretty lazy in August, September, so I, I'm missing out on my salads now. But I still have you know some coming up for, uh, for sure. Um, I was saying to Tom. I was saying uh, earlier to Laura. Uh, we had a little discussion about uh, garlic. Uh, do you do garlic, Tom? Yes, I, I was just I was just reminded as you were talking, I was going to say I just planted garlic two weeks ago too. So, okay, so you started yours two weeks ago. I'm going to like, again, it's an experiment. I'm going to wait a little bit longer, like like Laura, just because we've had a such a mild uh, fall so far. But I also wanted to ask, and this might be uh, beneficial to some others, some of the listeners. Where did you buy your garlic bulbs? Your planting bulbs? Uh, I usually get. Your I usually get my potatoes and my garlic and uh, my onion sets all from uh, pine tree garden seeds in Maine. Sure, in Maine. Yep, I've done them. Okay, all right. No, I was uh, just curious. And, and I've had good luck. And the garlic now, I you know when I harvest in August, I just save uh, two uh, this year three likely heads and separate them and replant. I'm not buying new garlic. Lovely. I'm just using my own garlic. Okay, just good. just keeping it going. See. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Perfect. And I've had I, I my garden is still producing too. I, I uh, got in a, a, a fall set of peas that is doing that they're, they're doing very nicely. I never get around to it. I always mean to, but this year I actually did it. Uh, and so we'll we'll see. Uh, have they blossomed? They, they have blossomed. I've I've had I've had peas, um, oh, much to my much to my uh, delight and surprise. Uh, I've got, you know, some, some cherry tomatoes still, I've got some basil going to seed, but still, still going some sweet potatoes. Um, and in terms of flowers, my New York asters 
have never looked better. I don't know if, if you grow them, but I really, I, I they're spectacular. Um, you know, I don't know if it was the way the summer went, all the rain, whatever it was, but in 30 years, these plants have never looked so beautiful. So I'm very, very grateful uh, Wait, that so, that occurred. So did you plant them or did you just let the, the native ones come in? Because, I, you know, I started getting interested in these plants more and realized a couple of years ago what they look like when they're tiny. So yes. now I have uh, New York asters everywhere. They're literally, they seed like mad. And, and so this is what's happened. They, I, I planted three plants and now over 30 years and some I'm sure getting trampled and died and this and that and the other, it is now a nice full swath of, yeah. of and it's, they're beautiful. I really, I, I've, not, I've not had them look so healthy, so full. Uh, they just look right. I mean, how you hope they're going to look, it took 30 years. Well, they, well they, get very, they get very tall and they like to yes. lean over. So you have to sort of prop them up sometimes. Well, there's enough, there's enough around them that's tall that's sort of holding them together. They're not just stuck in the middle of something. Um, yes. So I'm very, very, very pleased uh, with that. You guys sold me on that. Um, I'm, I'm uh, familiar with the asters, not the New York asters. Every now and then I like to dabble with uh, certain flowers. I'll try something different every every season. And this is on my list. I just wrote it down. Excellent. Um, learn Excellent. A, little, a little bit more about it and see if it's well, if it's adaptable to in Tom's area, it's certainly going to be adaptable in my sure. area. Sure. So close. Sure, sure. Um, so I'm going to have to uh, do a little homework on that. And um, looks like I'll be doing some New York asses next year. Good. Yeah, and it's a native and wonderful. Don't buy time. any. Just stop by. I'll give you five or six. Bingo. That's okay. Welcome to the garden. Welcome to the garden. They're everywhere. Okay. Uh, you, I'll, uh, you'll be hearing from me in a couple of days, Tom. I'll be, uh, yeah, okay. sure. I just want to know. Great. Excellent. Anyone doing anything special for fall cleanup? Nothing special. What, anything what do you mean? in particular, anything in particular you think folks might like to know about that they might not? Well, we can go into the current thinking on this is that I used to clean used to cut everything down and clean things up and rake the leaves out and put them in a nice pile somewhere else. And now I kind of let everything stay put. Unless, with the exception of if there's a stalk that looks particularly ugly, like dark brown and grayish black, they don't appeal to me. So I tend to cut those stalks away this time of year. But, you know, mature seed pods that with still some green leaves on perennials, I leave them up. I let the leaves fall where they may. And by the time uh, March comes around, most of them have blown into the deep woods anyhow. But um, yeah, the, the current thinking is don't clean up your garden and, exactly. and, you know, or wait till spring. And even then you want to wait until, you know, you have a lot of green poking through because uh, all that leaf litter and, and dead stalks provide homes to a lot of beneficial insects. And we're trying to encourage the growth of those populations. We are the only thing I cut back are my herbaceous peonies and I, I, you know, those go in the trash. They don't go in the compost pile. Uh, just because of uh, boitrous is that how it's pronounced? Uh, it's the only thing that kills peonies. So you want them. You don't want to leave those. Um, lying around and, and so they look ugly. So you should cut them. They get all that dark black and they, they it's bad the for them. And I go, love they them. Look bad. So I want them, I want them to be healthy and healthy and well, but everything else I'm very happy to leave most particularly things with with hollow stems um, for for the bugs to be able to overwinter and lots and lots and lots of seeds. Roger, anything you'd like to add? I have a question, a hotline question for you two master gardeners. Um, <laughs> I, I recently harvested my uh, milkweed pots. Uh, they were just about breaking. I, I have them in a brown paper bag out in the garage, and it's open, so I have some nice airflow. Some of them were damp, and I was very concerned. I, I didn't want them to to spoil. Um, but so far, so good. I'll, I'll have a huge bag of a, um, a milkweed seed. The question is, I have usually I would cut the stalks down ground level and, and get them out of the garden. Should I let them sit over the winter? I would. I'm, yeah. Okay. All right. I would. Good. Tom, what, what would you do? do? You would if they weren't ugly. <laughs> exactly. And uh, <laughs> my newest garden where my milk, my incarnata is, um, I'm trying to go for the meadow effect. So I'm really leaving most of that there. It was, it, the meadow effect uh, that I've done in that garden had attracted a great deal of pollinators this year. Lots of monarchs, lots of bees, lots of nice. flies. So um, 
to continue that, the process should be to leave those stocks to encourage the, the, the uh, even further growth next year of the insect populations. I agree, and I am I am looking forward to because I too save seeds. Uh, I am going to uh, scatter some and see how they do, but I'm also saving some to winter sow, so that I have plant actual plants uh, to plant uh, in some other areas of the garden in order to. Uh, Continue to develop the milkweed on the property. So, I was speaking with uh, Laura before we started, um, just on the same topic, um, and I was saying I'm, every year I like to do some something different, some little experiment uh, to learn by it. And, and what I've what I've done uh, this year, I have several garden areas, all raised beds. Um, I've really downsized. And I was saying to Laura, in this one uh, small area. Um, I just put down the past week or so a layer of comp composted manure, nice thick layer, about two, at least an inch, maybe two, maybe two inches. After I took the weeds out and, and such, this is where I had grown tomatoes and eggplants. Got rid of the all the tomatoes just because I had a, a late blight and fungus and the spores are going to overwinter. And what the experiment is, after I put down the compost, I put down um, some unprinted corrugated uh, cardboard. Uh, number one, to keep the weeds out in the springtime. Um, I get a great crop of weeds every spring in this particular garden in Narragansett. So, but also I want to see what the worms do with it because it's corrugated cardboard. And I remember uh, taking some some classes with Reinhard um, and, and seeing his um, his worm composting, and just to see how the worm uh, the worm uh, hotel does uh, with corrugated. Um, cardboard and, and the manure. And I think in another area also to suppress weeds, instead of the thick cardboard, I'm going to do a couple of layers of just plain old Narragansett Time newspaper um, and wet it down and, you know, anchor it um, and then just see if it does decompose rapidly enough. If it does um, uh, feed the, the little guys uh, that have been winter down there. And I'm going to do it in two areas and just see what happens with it. These are existing gardens you're talking about. Correct. Small, because, very manageable. Because the newspaper, uh, the lasagna method is is exactly. the classic methodology for creating a new garden. Yep. I thought that's what you were talking about. You're talking about your actual garden. You're putting this down to feed the worms more. Oh, um, number one to keep the weeds out. Number two, yeah. um, if I can encourage the, uh, the uh, microbial activity or the worm activity, um, you know, to me that's just a bonus. Um, I've seen it done before. I was somewhat familiar with the lasagna, um, uh, which is kind of similar to the Hulka Garten. Um, um, the whole culture. Yes, yes. Yes. That, that, to some degree, uh, except the, the cult, whatever, however you pronounce it, the Hulka culture <laughs> is that it's usually a pile, a, right. almost yes. like yeah. a dome. Right. It's yeah. much and, higher. And, and, and you need space for that. So now I've, I've really downsized. I have several gardens, but this, they're all very small, very manageable, uh, which I'm enjoying now. Um, so that's something different. I'm going to try this year, see what happens. Well, that's good. I, I like, I've had great success with the lasagna method yeah. uh, for new beds and even, even rejuvenating uh, current beds. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wish you a lot of luck with that, Roger. And, and when, Assuming that 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 continues, when would you uh, put uh, soil and compost over it and and plant something? Well, I, I don't plan on doing that. What I plan is just to leave the card the cardboard there, see how much it decomposes. If there's anything left over in the spring, I'll remove it. And underneath that, I have some nice rich soil to start with, with no weeds. That's my that's my goal. Excellent. And then um, All of our try goals. with the thinner newspaper so i'm sure that's going to decompose even more but how much remains to be seen so if there is any left over perhaps i'll just turn it over and incorporate it uh because that's my c my carbon for my um you know for a compost uh you know, ratio three part carbon one part nitrogen a mm -hmm. green brown so i'm going to add some brown to it and just see what happens something different it's a small area so excellent yeah excellent um so i guess it is time to move to our questions Sure. Um, our first question is from Kathy in Willimantic. How harmful are jumping worms to plant health? Now, I know Tom has never seen one and neither have I. Roger, have you seen them? Well, yes. Um, <laughs> I was un unfamiliar with these things until about a year ago. 
And I believe I had, got involved with a discussion with someone at a farmer's market, and that was followed up this spring at the hotline mm -hmm. of some fellow master gardeners. And yeah, these things are crazy. Um, they look like big worms, uh, big neurotic worms. They just won't <laughs> stop. Um, I wouldn't say they jump, but I know obviously they got the nickname jumping because they're extremely active and, and move very, very quickly and they're large. Um, almost snake-like. Well, baby snake, um, but much, much bigger than much, much big, a baby snake, but much, much bigger than, than what we know as as our European earthworms. And certainly, they're they're invasive. Brought over um, from Asia, um, they definitely can damage, uh, do a number to the garden, um, and, and and can be um, injurious to a uh, to plant. Um, for a couple of things, they they damage the roots. They eat the roots. Uh, ferocious appetites. They eat a lot of organic material. Um, they grow very, very fast. Um, they re reproduce even uh, very, very quickly as well. Uh, once they're in soil, they're infested in the soil, and there hasn't yet been there's research done on it at other extension universities, but there hasn't been a successful me method uh, developed uh, to eradicate them. Um, so. As a matter of fact, I think I was Corliss uh, down in Westerly. Um, do, do you know Corliss Merkel? I do. Uh, Laura? Okay. I, of, a, of her. Yeah, because she's involved heavily with the Wilcox Park. Yes. And I think it was. I think it was one of that group uh, where we had the discussion from. Um, so apparently they're down there somewhere. Um, I've seen them, um, and uh, yeah, you don't want them. And right now we don't know how to get rid of them if you do have them. But they, they're not good. For, they're not good for your plants. Not good for your garden at all. They're going to they're going to shrew out the American earth, uh, not the American, excuse me, the European earthworm. Also invasive, but that's been here for centuries. So what do we tell this poor lady? Start gardening in a different area. Uh, yeah. Um, well, that's the beauty about raised beds. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, start out clean. Start out in a different area. Um, take away its food supply. Um, that's the best way to, to deter. You know any any uh, uh, well Tom's feeding his his uh, a groundhog. I fed my <laughs> this year, so as long as we keep get, keep the the food supply away, they're going to go elsewhere and look for something. So you want to keep true. the food supply That's away. That's true. They do. The, the, I don't know if they're more predominant in lawns, although I have seen pictures of the lawn damage, uh, very similar to a grub damage. The grass just turns brown and, and dies off. Because there's no root system, these things just chew up the roots. So hey. if it's in the vegetable garden, I'd I'd let that garden fallow, and um, relocate our, another raised bed elsewhere. Well, I I was also doing some research, though I've not seen them that they they also eat the duff off the forest floor. Mm -hmm. Oh which yeah, is, yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, horrible. And they travel. That too, that too. So good luck with that, Kathy. We uh, we 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 are sorry that you have the problem, and, and we hope that uh, they find a way of um, handling them Kathy? soon. Where was Kathy from? Uh, Willow Okay, so okay, all right, okay. Uh, so Mike from Providence uh, would like to know: Do lawn fertilizers with high rates of phosphates have a negative effect when used near the Narragansett sewer system? Well, that's a complex question. It all depends on on how the runoff is running. I mean, exactly. Uh, if if you're fertilizing right next to your driveway and the lawn is higher than the driveway, then the answer is yes. Those phosphates will wash out in heavy rain and will go down into the sewers. So, you know, our you know, our general advice is is not to use a lot of that kind of fertilizer in the in the watershed and. If you do, do it circumspectly and do not uh, fertilize near the near the runoff area. That's the best I could suggest. I think. Uh, I agree with uh, Tom's first uh, reaction to the question. Um, if this was on a test, I would think it would might be a trick question. Right. So I read it a couple of times, and the word that jumped out at me: uh, do lawn fertilizers with high rates right. of phosphates. That, that's that's the kick right there. Of course, you're not going to do anything with a high rate. You want to do what's appropriate. Um, so, what is appropriate? Well, uh, what I would suggest is 
in, in March, let's do a, a soil anal analysis, do a soil test at UConn um, and, and see what your phosphorus, your, your potassium, your magnesium, your, your calcium, see what your levels are. And if you're already at optimum or higher, then you don't need anything. Because um, certainly a lot of people will add things to their garden and they do get excessive amounts. Yes, too much phosphorus is is not good. It's going to uh, produce uh, algae blooms, uh, taking oxygen out of the out of the streams, and that's that's what we hear about. Easily avoidable. I mean, if you need it, you use it, and the plants will use it. If you don't need it, don't add it. And that's what you're when you look at your um, fertilizer bag. You have your three numbers: your NPK. First one is your nitrogen. Second one is your phosphate. And the K is your potassium. So know what your uh, levels are of each uh, in an analysis and then apply appropriately. Uh, a soil analysis will not uh, include nitrogen just because it's used up uh, so quickly uh, by plants. So it's hard to give it a constant measure. Uh, with the other micronutrients and macronutrients, um, they're, they're going to be uh, uh, more of a steady uh, uh, level. Uh, the amounts that we used are a little bit less. Yes, I mean, and the only thing that I would add to your excellent an answers, both of you, is that if you are cutting your lawn, uh, to leave the clippings, to leave the lawn clippings there, um, rather than take them out, and that you know will of course help the natural phosphorus uh, level uh, stay a bit higher. Therefore, I would hope uh, lessening the need for phosphorus in your lawn fertilizer. And nitrogen too when you leave your gra grass clippings. Exactly. Just as long as your, your grass clippings are six inches high, you know, <laughs> you're going to develop your thatch. But you know, if if, if you cut cut on a regular basis and they're, they're relatively short, yeah, it's going to build up your um your soil profile. I was going to say that this year I'm a convert to cutting high. Um, I've always I always had cut it short before, and this year my lawnmower kicked, and I hired this guy, and he cuts it high, and it. The lawn has never looked better. Granted, it's been a terrific year for grass because it's rained all the time. But right, no, uh, I've always I've always cut mine high, and I have to say, I am so I was so surprised this summer, just sort of driving around town, seeing how low everybody else had their grass cut. Yep, and it just it just oof, no. So I'm glad you're well, liking it, Tom. It I, makes I, a big I, difference. I mean, the grass yeah. is lush right yes. now in in October. It's just lush. Yes, and he, he cuts it once a week and can all throughout the summer. I mean, like I said, it's been a terrific year for grass. Yes. It's, just, it's so much rain that everything is fine. <laughs> right. it's, it's the only summer I can remember in Narragansett where we didn't have burned out grass somewhere. It, everything mm -hmm. is green this year. Yes, it's been delightful. You know, Except the bugs and it. the slugs are having a good time here, which is another one of your questions, I think, about the hostas. The slugs are having a field day this year. Exactly. So let's get to let's get to let's get to uh, Karen's question from Warwick. Um, she has a uh, hundred plus hostas that have suffered horribly from Japanese beetle this summer. Uh, she's never seen it so bad bad this for uh, before. How does she get rid of these horrible horrible things? I don't think it's Japanese beetles. I I, I did a little research myself on this, and yeah. the Japanese beetles do not favor eating hosta. But my own hosta this year are. They look like they've been peppered by a uh, you know, bird shot. They're 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 full of holes and they've been eaten. And it's 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 pretty sure that it's um, slugs. And the answer on slugs is diatomaceous earth around the base of the plant to make it hard for those little guys to crawl across the soil and up mm -hmm. into your plant. But uh, I'm pretty sure that kind of damage is probably slug damage rather than Japanese beetles. I mean, you may have seen some on there, but it's not their preferred. Uh, Food and they have many other plants they far prefer than, than hosta. When I saw the question too, I, I did a little research on it myself. And um, what I what I learned again, that's why I love this group. I always learn something every day. I had thought I, at first I, I looked at the question with at grub. I didn't focus on on the on the food choice of which is the hosta, and that's the woman's question. But I looked at the grub situation a little bit, and what I had learned. I was under the impression I, I'm familiar with the life cycle chart that we have at the, at the hotline. So I'm familiar with the what the grub, what the Japanese beetle looks like throughout the year. And I, I was always uh, under the impression that you're going to prevent 
any damage in the early spring or earlier in the spring, say, say May-ish, uh, for your preventative uh, maintenance. But I didn't realize, and particularly this fall being so mild, that the grubs are still eating. They're still eating the grass roots. Uh, so a second treatment um, is appropriate uh, for some people uh, with lawns. Now I'm speaking specifically with lawns. So what my takeaway here is I only thought you would treat for grubs in the spring, but it's very appropriate to treat for grubs on a lawn spring and fall, which I did not know. Looking back at the question, I read it again because I looked at it as a test question, and the key <laughs> word was hosta. And I went, oh, okay, that's different. Maybe the beetles don't go after the hostas. Maybe something else is. And yeah, Tom nailed it. Slugs. So, Roger, since you brought it up, you should say what what do you treat the lawn with? There's several treatments. Um, if you want to go the chemical roof, there's the Grub X, which is quite effective. Um, microbials. Um, one microbial that I found that was uh, effective as well. Bacillus thuringiensis, we know it as Bt, um, very common. Uh, a lot of master gardeners use it. Um, naturally occurring, organic, and all that. It's a micro, uh, uh, microbial uh, bacillus, um, very effective. Not as effective on nematodes um, and milky spore. No, milky spore. Milky spore. Yeah, that also not as effective. Um, and the, the strategies that, that uh, were suggested, uh, preventative um, May-June area where the uh, larvae are coming, coming up and they're going to turn into the uh, Japanese beetle that we're familiar with. Japanese beetle is going to lay its eggs in July, August, early, even early September. Um, there's a treatment then. And then now, which I've learned is a fall treatment um, uh, on, on the grubs. So you either go the, the chemical way with your grub X or something similar. I don't know the chemical name in grub X. It escapes me right now. Um, but the uh, gentler um, approaches are going to be with BT, um, which, which seems to be the most effective. I did, I did uh, find some very good information from our fellow master gardeners at the Purdue Extension yes. um, with white grub management. Uh, but now we're kind of off this this woman's this uh, uh, woman's problem with her hostess because it's not gross. But, <laughs> so but we I, do I have we only have fifteen more minutes. I so I let I think, us let us please. Um, yeah, I, I think I think the discussion on 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 grubs is is worthwhile because a lot of people are paying attention to their lawns. Um, so Laura, back back to uh, the slugs because yeah. they are so bad this year. If we have a similar year next year. What I what I intend to do is buy diatomaceous earth, and before the hostas get huge, I will spread some around the base to get them a head start. Because the damage, I don't know <clears throat> the questioner whether she saw the damage occur about the same time I did. The hostas look good up until about mid-August, and then they started being eaten. And I think that coincides with the growth uh, and life cycle of the slugs that and the, a few that I've found, I haven't really gone out assiduously in the middle of the night with a flashlight, but the few that I found are, are pretty big. So they're, they're happy and they're eating lots and lots of pasta. So a little garlic, butter, parsley, and some good French bread. And <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. I just, I'll leave just that to you. Thank you. Uh, so Bruce from Wakefield would like to know. Uh, I have recently planted new new grass. Can I apply a natural fertilizer on the newly seeded lawn? Roger, what's a natural fertilizer? Well, yeah, he do, he doesn't say, and he doesn't call it organic. Yeah, um, yeah. There's, I, have more, I have more questions about the question. Um, the thing <laughs> is, what I, I'd be concerned about is don't over fertilize. I'm not a lawn guy. We have some lawn people at the hotline and certainly encourage Good people yeah. uh, to, to go, uh, go go to the hotline. Um, but my reaction, though, is uh, the seed starter um, <coughs> a fertilizer that I, I've used myself. It was recommended. Um, but there's this this products now I don't have to name the brand names, but there's products now where the grass seed comes covered with the mulch and a fertilizer already and the stuff's really a no-brainer they use it at uri all the time you just put it down you wet it and that's it and 10 days later you have some grass growing um 
So I, I, I just be very careful over fertilizing it because that's, that's, that's not a good, good thing to do. Um, once it's established, perhaps a light coating of fertilizer before the winter really sets in, but I, I would defer that to a lawn management person. I agree that I, I don't think if you're starting seed this time of year, it, you probably don't need to fertilize and you might look at it next spring, but this is the time that grass really likes to grow and it's the weather has been fine. I, unless your ground is really, um, really unfertile, I, I think you should not fertilize at this point. I, I would agree and I would also suggest as I, as I know Roger would that maybe you get a soil test of your lawn to see what's there already. Yeah. Big believer. Good gentlemen. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn from Bristol says that squash and cucumber did not do well in her garden. Only one zucchini and one cute grew. Uh, do they require a more alkaline soil? My tomatoes, green peppers, carrots, string beans, and collard greens did well. How is one supposed to grow vegetables that need a different pH? Most garden vegetables like a pH between six and seven. Exactly. Uh, does that mean growing something at five, three will not produce? No, you just won't get as many or as big or as nice. Um, your ideal, and again, it depends on the specific crop, which you should identify the pH, but roughly if you're between six and seven. So if she had good luck with other uh, vegetables in the garden and very specifically squash and cucumber did not look, look did not do well. I would look either at a pathogen uh, or an insect. Absolutely. After those two plants, um, because if, if she's, we'll, we'll just say the garden is six to seven or even five and a half to seven. Let's say it's a little bit acidic, uh, five and a half to six, two, let's say. And she did get um, some, uh, some good vegetables with the carrots and the green beans, the tomatoes and the, and the collard greens. I don't think it's pH. I think it's something else. Yeah, I would concur with that. And um, it, what was left out of the question is, is what happened to those plants? Did the cucumbers start to lose their leaves? Did they start to turn yellow? Did you start to see uh, uh, ugly brown or grayish leaves on the squash? They never got really large, like what you said about your plants, Roger. And I did have a, I went to a, a seminar that was given at the URI from the um, agronomy farm. And uh, I think it was Dr. Brown. And I learned something at that that I hadn't heard before. She said that this year, again, with the wet conditions and an early storm, that downy mildew has been a major problem in crops. And there's a downy mildew for all of these kinds of uh, crops. Uh, cucumbers, there's a downy mildew for that. The squash, there's a downy mildew. And green beans, too, will get it. And what she told me is that downy mildew does not winter over here in the north. But... Uh, they ride the storms that ride up the coast. And generally we see them like a hurricane or a tropical storm come in August or September. Fascinating. And, but this year there was that storm that rode up the coast sure. in June. And th apparently that brought downy mildew to a lot of gardens in Rhode Island. I, my, my cucumbers flourished briefly and then went all yellow. I picked off most of the yellow leaves and I did get a second little flush. Uh, the squash, same thing. I had I had difficulty growing squash this year. So to your Same original point, yes. Roger, I think it's probably likely that there were pathogens afoot that probably hurt the cucumbers and the squash this year. Well, mm. No, mine did not do well either, although uh -huh. I, I don't don't spend as much time on I don't put so much attention on them. So if they do well, they do well, and if they don't, eh. um, but um, I've never had a year where everything has done well. I mean, part of gardening, it, I mean, look at what she did have go well. Uh, that to me is a successful year. Excellent point. Um, thank you. Uh, so Judith in Barrington uh, wants to know what blooming perennials will grow well in the shady parts of her garden. And she is in Barrington. Long, long list. Long list, a wonderful list. First question is, uh, do deer get in there? Because everyone's favorite shade plant is a hosta, but it's also uh, the deer favorite plant as well. So if you don't get deer, there's what hundreds of varieties of hosta. Um, in the spring, I like uh, um, uh, lungwort, which is uh, the Latin is something else. It's not coming to me, but uh, there's uh, uh, anemone will grow in, in the shade garden and flower 
profusely. Uh, ligularia, which makes a nice yellow, uh, almost like a, uh, a black eyed Susan flower in August. It's a nice late bloomer. Um, uh, a native fleece, fleece flower grows six feet tall with yep. white flowers. That's very pretty in the shade. Ah, what else? What else? What else? Anemones will grow Primrose. in the shade. Primrose, uh, bleeding, uh, bleeding heart. Bleeding hearts, right? Bleeding hearts are great. Vein. Trillium. Yeah. Uh, iris Lagera will bloom. Lots. Uh, iris will bloom in the in the shade. It won't bloom as many flowers as it does in the sun, but you'll get flowers in the shade and it makes a nice textural change. Monkshood, Solomon seal. Um, lots, lots and lots and lots, Judith. I think if you if you look up online, uh, take our suggestions, but look up online, you are going to have a, a, a beautiful uh, number of plants that should grow beautifully. And if you do have deer, uh, then you can just filter that through what is deer resistant and still come down uh, with a really lovely, wonderful list of of uh, plants in the shade. The only thing, the only other thing I would I would throw in there is that I've got some shady parts that only become shady once the trees are in bloom. So I can get some beautiful bulbs in that need full sun at the moment. Uh, and then as they as they uh, die off the, uh, and the trees, you know, uh, leaf out, um, then they need shadier things. So you, she may, you might, Judith, um, have a little bit of play there uh, that you don't realize. It's a whole wonderful new uh, thing to explore shade gardens. Once you get into it, it you're, you're always finding new things that will grow there. And to Laura's point, in addition to bulbs, uh, the Native American, North American ephemerals like bloodroot and. Uh, uh, Anyone needs I'm, bloodroot, give me a call. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of what they look up uh, North American ephemerals and you'll see, see all sorts of pretty little flowers that will grow in the shade and will disappear once the once the trees leaf out totally the summer comes along totally they're 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 lovely they're lovely uh we have a live question from joseph gallo uh do any of you plant fall ground cover to help with improving organics over the winter in the gar in the vegetable garden is the question right i would think i would imagine yeah i i, I have in other years this year I, I have enough going that I, I, I don't have a place for it, but Roger has put his garden to bed. Roger, did you put a ground cover on? Not, no, uh, only because these gardens are very, very small. Um, in, in my previous uh, uh, residence, I had a 1200 uh, square foot garden. Um, it, it, that was big. And I definitely did uh, winter rye uh, pretty much. Um, the thing I learned about winter, winter rye, if you don't cut it down in the spring, it's a monster to a till under, um, and I wanted to get away from tilling as well. So I did a, um, I did experiment with the last few years I was at this location with clover, um, and that was a lot easier to turn under than the winter rye. Um, but it's always nice to, um, I guess the older farmers around here would call it green manure. You know, so mm -hmm. you always want to give give the microbes and the organisms and the soil uh, below our feet something to do all winter. Yeah, it might be cold. You know, maybe some of them go to Florida or. You know, just to take a break from from all the action, um, but it's always nice to have um, um, uh, nutrition uh, down there. Um, so, uh, a winter a winter crop is a good idea. It helps with erosion. It's going to feed the soil. It's going to improve the texture, um, and it's really just a matter of uh, of choice which cover crop you want to use. I'm only familiar with winter rye. It's it's a bear to uh, control it, but it, but it is very very good. Um, I've experimented with clover, which uh, worked out pretty good. That was the red, uh, I believe it was the red clover. Um, but there's a number of others. Um, any grain store or seed store, uh, you know, can help you with that. Or again, call the hotline. We have one more question from Facebook. How do you get rid of white flies? I had them in my garden on a squash plant. Uh, I need my, my cheat sheet for that one. It's in, the, it's in no. the other room. I, I, I have a list of all, all, all the all the insects and it matches up with what to do with each insect and I can't pull it off the top of my head. Um, but uh, white fly, that, 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 that's easy enough to, to look up and find. We, we, we can find that for you. Tom, do you have anything? I don't have anything. 
Uh, I occasionally get them inside, uh, and I've really? used those uh, yellow sticky traps. Um, put it. Yeah. In, uh, just a, there's a, a little pin that goes into the soil, and you put the yellow sticky trap on it, and put it right next to the plant, and it attracts a lot of white flies, and it, it generally does a good job on on reducing. I, I don't think you get them all, but it reduces the population. But mm, I, good I'm, idea. And not usually get them outside, so that's that's odd that they were that bad outside. Because I would think outside, whatever predates on whitefly would be all over that if there was a that many of them. And I mean, I would I would I would always start just as I would with aphids, um, a little dawn and some water and a spray and a spray thing, uh, yeah. just to see if that did anything. It won't hurt anything, uh, and it might help. Two easy methods. I, I like the sticky, the sticky tape and <laughs> the dish soap. What could be easier than that? You know, just just to try. Yeah. Um, so please, uh, that is that is. We are wrapping up. It's two minutes before the hour. Um, thank you for tuning in. If you have any feedback or suggestions, uh, please complete the survey that I'm sure Francesca uh, has put in the chat. Uh, we would love to have uh, any ideas for future radio hours or topics. And certainly, I think slugs and grubs. Uh, maybe, maybe some of them, please um, spread the word and let your friends know that we can be found um, on the, uh, on the Facebook and on the master gardener uh, Instagram for updates. Um, thank you both Roger and Tom lovely sure. to speak with you this evening. I hope perhaps to see you this weekend. Um, and meet you in person uh, for everyone. Thank you so very much and have a lovely evening. Good night. Good night. Thank you.